uh, based on what their priorities are. And they're very systemic in nature. They're not time-bound and outcome-based sectorally. They're systemic in nature, and that is a very important and profound difference. The second difference is that the, and, and as I've just mentioned, the MDGs were donor to recipient. The SDGs are supposed to be owned and led by countries. The third difference is that the MDGs, for the MDGs, the frame of reference was governments. Uh, but in the framing of the SDGs, it is clearly and very explicitly um, stated that in order to overcome the constraints that countries face, the civil society and the private sector have to be part of the solution. And this is clearly a very profound departure in the framing of the UN system in terms of how it looks at the contribution of the private sector. The other difference relates to the fact that there was no focus on systemic constraints. So corruption, accountability were taboo words for the MDGs. But in the framework of the SDGs, systemic constraints, accountability, independent accountability, accountability for results, the notion of addressing corruption is very much part of the recipe to overcome the development constraints the world faces. Uh, and then, of course, along with it is the need to disaggregate data because it is useful for gender outcomes, it is useful for a number of different outcomes, because the averages tend to hide inequities, which was very much the focus of the MDGs. So for a number of different reasons, the SDGs, uh, which countries are meant to own and the countries are meant to frame, are very empowering for countries, and that is how exactly it should be. About the same time, that the SDGs were framed, there was also another very profound um, development in the international circles, which was the switch in, finance, in, the, in the financing construct. Because previously, alongside the MDGs came the Paris Declaration on Aid Effectiveness, the ACRA Agenda, and that framing changed when the ADIS meeting happened back in 2015. Again, signaling that countries are meant to mobilize indigenous revenue, that countries are meant to address corruption, collusion, and systemic inefficiencies and take responsibility for development. And here is, are a set of 17 goals and the time-bound outcome-based metrics under that which we have constructed through an intergovernmental process, but ultimately it is your responsibility to own what you would like. Uh, and alongside that came the era of, the, of human capital development. Because now research tells us that the most important wealth of a country is its human resource. It is not physical capital, it is not environmental capital. And that 60% of the wealth of a country can be attributed to its people. So profound is this realization that as soon as 2025, the international financial institutions will start ranking countries for their borrowing costs according to their human capital rankings, which means that if the social indicators of a country are lagging, their borrowing costs are going to be higher because they're more likely to default. Uh, and then, of course, another important difference between the MDGs and the SDGs is that the SDGs are meant to be whole of government. There is no idea of a siloed approach within the SDGs. So there is what I, I have tried to emphasize in the last couple of minutes is that we have, that the world has really shifted in terms of how it looks at development. Uh, and of course, our leaders have been signatory to, signatory to those agreements. I would now like to spend a couple of minutes explaining to you, as you would expect me to talk about SRS, how the SRS program resonates with, some of the, with the spirit of the SDGs. This is not a compact which was developed with consultants flown from, ab from abroad. The SRS was developed by people on this ground, taking stock of the limitations that we have and the opportunities that we're likely to reap. 
SAS is a whole of government, multi-sectoral, multi-component initiative, arguably one of the most ambitious development programs a government has ever espoused in, in this country. And we have the complete support of Excellency the Prime Minister and Excellency the President for this, for the compact that has been created. This is a project, this is an umbrella initiative with, with 134 pro programs, policies, and initiatives. Uh, and it resonates with 10 of the SDGs. I'll just quickly go over some of its features. Firstly, it's a whole of government program. 34 federal ministries, all provincial governments are contributed to this program in a synchronized, coordinated manner. Secondly, it's a program that proactively involves the private sector in execution. And even over the last six months, there are many examples of how this has been mainstreamed in reality. So we have done a procurement of the digital payment system over the last couple of months. Uh, we have contracted our work around uh, access to finance to 22 NGOs. We uh, mainstreamed the role of a, a Karachi-based NGO that could do uh, soup kitchens very well. So wherever the default is that if the private sector partner can do it better for us, we contract out the work for them. Uh, and of course, there are many other initiatives in the pipeline which, which will mainstream the role of the private sector. We have three prize funds that have been announced. They have, the date is, has been closed on the 15th of October. There are five solution challenges which were launched. Uh, the, the, the date closure was 30th November. Uh, and there are many other uh, initiatives with private sector involvement. For instance, on the 13th of this month, uh, in partnership with Facebook, we have a hackathon, the first of a series of hackathons to develop a campaign on malnutrition. Today, I'm going to be hosting uh, the women chambers in the Prime Minister's Secretariat. Uh, so just to let you know, there are various structured mechanisms of, in, of um, mainstreaming the private sector into our work and into our planning. Um, thirdly, in terms of how SRS resonates with the Sustainable Development Framework, as you know, on, the, on, November, 20, on November 12th, the Cabinet approved the SRS Governance and Integrity Policy. It's a comprehensive 22-27-faceted policy, uh, which is meant to plug leakages and pilferages from the system. Uh, SRS, one of the four SRS pillars is human capital development. We look at malnutrition in all its forms. Gender is mainstreamed through and through in the program with many threads. And if I start talking about it, we may take another hour, so I will, I will pass. Um, technology is a very key feature from the door-to-door, -door, end end-to-end digital survey that is currently in the field to our digital payment system to the precision safety net which is going to be launched in February. Uh, technology is at the core of what we do, uh, is, the, is at the core of the precision safety nets we've created. So let me talk a little bit about technology more broadly as part of the sustainable development frame aside from SRS. As you know, our government is very squarely pursuing this agenda. We are cognizant that we are living in a country where this evening your children will order a pizza or an Uber, and the same organizations in the private sector will deliver trackability, transparency, accountability to you when you order a pizza or when you order an Uber. And there is no justification for public sector institutions not to be taking advantage of those capabilities to plug the leakages and pilferages and inefficiencies from the system that we know exists. So the government is squarely focused on that. Whether it is in the ubiquitous deployment of e-office and e-procurement, or whether it is a full conversion to e-revenue, um, e uh, or whether it is taking full advantage of the data analytics cap capacity of NADRA, or whether it is um, the, the targeting mechanism that is implicit in the, in, in the National Socioeconomic Registry, the work that I lead. 
Uh, there is every effort in the government to make sure that we make use of databases and connectivity and technology. And it is not just these systems, it is also the enabling environment for them. And the enabling environment for these comes through, of course, the, the, the handsets, because with past experiences we saw that if the cost of the handset is prohibitive, the, the digital solutions are not going to work because they will not be in the hands of poor people. So there is a concomitant effort to reduce the price of handsets. Uh, there is also an effort uh, underway to increase the footprint of connectivity through the Universal uh, Service Fund. And, but, and going back to SRS, we are taking full advantage of the disruptive potential for cell phones. For example, our, one of our procurements is underway to get a digital online education system that the government could pay for and that it could provide free resources, especially to the far flung areas. That procurement is ongoing, another three months, and we will have the solution for scale up. Secondly, the agriculture value chain and the rural transformation value chain building uh, policy and the work that is underway will ensure that digital solutions are embedded in the value chain efforts. An expert group is meeting and will very shortly come up with the recommendations and many international partners are involved with us in that line of work. Uh, and then of course, as you, you may all know, um, the Prime Minister has already approved the policy of access to cell phones for the seven million women who get stipends through the BISP program under the SRS framework. 